Hey everyone, good afternoon. I'm Susan Kaufman. I'm here for Attitudes Weekly ADHD Experts broadcast. And today we're gonna to be talking with Dr. Roberto Olivardia about sleep. Um, you may not be aware of this. You may think that you alone have sleep problems, but it turns out that people with attention deficit disorder very often struggle with sleep, whether it's difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, problems waking up, or issues about staying awake during the day. In fact, so serious sleep disorders are extremely common in children, both children and adults with ADHD. And furthermore, studies show that poor or insufficient sleep, obviously, no surprise, exacerbates ADHD symptoms. Today, Dr. Olivardia, who we are super pleased to have back with us, will tell us about ADHD-friendly interventions for sleep problems, a little bit more about the research on the unique challenges of the ADHD brain, and give us some examples of people with ADHD who have manage their sleep um their sleep issues so let me introduce him to you he dr olivardio is a clinical psychologist and a lecturer in psychology in the department of psychiatry at the harvard medical school he's in private psychotherapy practice in lexington massachusetts where he specializes in the treatment of adhd also obsessive compulsive disorder body dysmorphic disorder and eating disorders um he currently serves on the scientific advisory board for attitude as well as Professional Advisory Board for CHAD, the Children and Adults with ADHD, for the Attention Deficit Disorder Association, ADA, and for the National Association of Males with Eating Disorders. We are so pleased to have Dr. Olivaria as part of our scientific advisory board. And we can, I can't tell you how much he has helped Attitude um, over the years, both with his knowledge and with his um, generosity in terms of helping us. Um, I wanna thank our sponsor today, uh, also very generous to support Attitudes webinars, that is Play Attention. Play Attention is a the leading neurocognitive training program. It's a form of brain training designed to strengthen executive function and self-regulation. Um, it's a comprehensive system that includes um, NASA-inspired technology, mindfulness training, cognitive training, behavior shaping, parent coaching, and a lot more. It's quite a, a broad program. Um, call 1-800-788-6786. That's 1-800-788-6786 or visit www.playattention.com to schedule a free professional consultation and an ADHD assessment. I'll just say the number one more time, 800-788-6786. Thank you, Play Attention. Um, to our listeners, a few quick comments about how our webinars work. Dr. Olivardio will talk for about a half an hour or so and they'll take your questions. You may enter those questions in the ask a question section of your screen. Down, you, if you'd like to, you can download the slides right now by clicking download the webinar slides. It's in the event resources section of your screen and um, some people like to take notes. And here's an important note. You know, as some of you know, we are now offering a certificate of attendance in order to have get that certificate at the end of the webinar you will see a post-event survey pop up. That survey will ask three questions about the quality of the webinar, whether you liked it, whether you thought it was excellent or not. And then that will be followed by three questions entitled required for certificate. If you'd like a certificate of attendance, which will be emailed to you, then you must answer those three questions before you leave the webinar. If you don't want to send the certificate, just move on. Although we appreciate your answering the, the general questions if you have time. Um, most audio issues, if you're having them, are caused by a slow internet connection or an incompatible browser. So please close all your other programs, maximize your bandwidth, and try refreshing your page if you have any trouble. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Olivardia with our thanks again for being here today. Great. Thank you. And it's always a pleasure to be uh, doing a webinar for Attitude, um, especially on an issue that... Uh, Professionally, I work a lot with in terms of my ADHD clients and as someone with ADHD can personally attest to as uh, someone could, could be a poster child for sleep problems and sleep disorders as I'll talk about throughout the presentation. Um, so first of all, just anecdotally, I personally don't know anyone with ADHD that does not have some issue with sleep. And hopefully through this presentation and understanding research, those of you who are out there who have ADHD and sleep problems, 
will feel a sense of validation and uh, a sense that you're not alone with it and that there are tools and strategies we can use to help you with that. So the research shows that anywhere from a quarter to half of people with ADHD have a diagnosable sleep disorder, which I'll talk about. Um, as I mentioned, the majority of people with ADHD have problems with sleep. And uh, a quote I had heard many years ago, which is a great one is to someone with ADHD going to bed is sitting in a boring dark room waiting for nothing to happen. Um, so for a lot of people with ADHD, there's, it's a plethora of different sleep problems. Um, the most common that I hear is the difficulty falling asleep and parents will who I uh, whose kids that I work with or whose teenagers I work with will say that this occurred even when they think retrospectively to infancy with their ADHD children that it was very difficult um, that they had more sleep problems as an infant than uh, their non ADHD children or other friends of theirs who had children. And a lot of that is that it's very hard for the mind to shut off for a lot of people with ADHD. And the more that we start thinking about something, the more awake and revved up we can get, and now our body is not ready for slumber. Um, it's actually more kind of awake. Um, it can be very difficult, particularly when ADHD kids to take naps, even when they feel exhausted. You'll often hear parents complain um, that their ADHD children um, or when they're, again, babies, have given up their naps earlier than what they would have expected. And also, in addition to having that difficulty falling asleep, many, many people with ADHD report that at around 9 or 10 o'clock, they get this second wind, that they feel this incredible energy and find themselves sort of more alert, um, in which they often will try to capitalize in, on, which then makes it, again, difficult for them to fall asleep, and will often find themselves going to bed too late. So for... A lot of adults that I work with with ADHD, they'll say that they tend to go to bed 1, 2 a.m. is when they start feeling tired. And that is certainly something before having children. My ideal hours of sleep were 2 a.m. to 7 or 8 a.m. Um, and I'll tell you why that is. Um, now, in addition to difficulty falling asleep, the other big transition of the day is waking up in the morning. And despite having ample sleep, so the studies have shown that even with people with ADHD who get eight to nine hours of sleep still can have difficulty waking up in the morning. Um, they feel um, it's almost like waking up the dead. They feel like zombies. Um, I can tell you personally, when I was in high school, I don't think I fully woke up until the end of first period. Um, I don't even remember first period of my four years of high school because I was in a complete fog. Um, so even with that, there's something, even despite getting ample sleep, there's something about that transition of waking up that makes it very difficult. In addition, particularly with inattentive types, we'll actually see sometimes sleeping too much, sometimes sleeping 11 to 12 hours and still feeling tired, which can actually look like depression, but it is not necessarily depression. It's part of having ADHD. In addition, people with ADHD have difficulty maintaining alertness throughout the day. Um, I, If I was bored in school, I could, eat, I could fall asleep very, very quickly, despite the fact that the class before, I could be incredibly energized and highly participative. Um, if the stimulation wasn't there, it was either being the class clown or it was going to be like full-on narcolepsy. Um, and narcolepsy is a diagnosable sleep disorder where people have sudden attacks of sleepiness, um, often coupled with uh, sort of a motor paralysis um, and just without any, it just feels involuntary to the person. Now with ADHD, it can often be, you know, it's a different dimension of narcolepsy, one that is highly uh, contingent upon the level of stimulation in their environment. In addition, about a quarter of the ADHD population has something called restless leg syndrome, which is basically these um, twitches and almost look like spasms in the legs. So in essence, it's thinking of it as the ADHD person that's still moving, even though they're sleeping. Um, it can be very disruptive, certainly if they're sharing a bed with a, a spouse or partner, um, but even to themselves, it can sometimes wake themselves up um, in terms of these movements. And even when they look at 
uh, populations of people who have restless leg syndrome, the those who have ADHD and restless leg versus those who just have restless legs, the symptom severity is much higher in those with ADHD. Uh, sleep talking and sleepwalking are also very common um, in people with ADHD, and I certainly have had both. Um, in sleepwalking, eyes totally open, having full conversations and not being awake um, and only knowing that that was the case when my siblings tape recorded me for evidence because I didn't believe that I was actually talking and walking in my sleep. Um, and that was the only way that I realized that uh, that has happened. Um, full conversations. It's almost as if the ADHD brain just has a hard time settling down and fully immersing itself into sleep. Things like bruxism or teeth grinding are common, bedwetting, particularly in younger people with ADHD, something called sleep paralysis, which um, I have less so often now, but uh, prior to the age of 18 would have very often, which are episodes characterized by your you wake up out of the transition of sleep. And when we dream, our bodies are actually paralyzed. Our motor functions are set shut down. And when we wake up, we have consciousness and we have re regained control over our motor functions. With sleep paralysis, you're waking up, but your motor functions are still paralyzed. And it is a very terrifying experience. Um, it lasts maybe... I mean, for me, it was probably 30, 40 seconds, but 30, 40 seconds in which you are conscious and you cannot move is very, very scary. Um, and they are often coupled with something called a hypnagogic hallucination, which sounds psychotic, but it is not psychosis. And these hallucinations are often of images or individuals that have a very ominous, threatening presence. Um, and interestingly, as a side note, people who claim to be abducted by aliens, that you find that a very high percentage of them have sleep paralysis. So there's something about that, um, that obviously it's a lot more than sleep paralysis, but that's probably at its basis. Um, they're very, very scary episodes. And some people, um, can have them once a month, sometimes once a year. Some people never have them. I certainly had them very com very common experience when I was a, a child and adolescent. Um, sleep disorders like obstructive sleep apnea, which is basically where your body is um, either not breathing, uh, so you're holding, you're either holding your breath or not properly getting in oxygen in your body. And I could give a whole webinar just on sleep apnea, but in a nutshell, um, I was always a heavy snorer. Snoring is one of the most common symptoms of sleep apnea. Uh, it doesn't mean because you snore that you definitely have sleep apnea, but almost everyone with sleep apnea are the kind of snorers that people have to kick someone out of the bedroom um, because. So I was that kind of snorer, got a sleep study in my early 30s after working with a patient with ADHD and sleep apnea and realizing, hmm, I fit a lot of these criteria. And you need 20 events in an hour, which means that you're either stopping your breathing or your oxygen levels are desaturated uh, tremendously. You need 20 of those in an hour over a period of a couple hours to be diagnosed with sleep apnea. And I had 98 um, in an hour. So I was pretty much through the roof. Um, and I have, I had a severely deviated septum in my nose. So my anatomy apparently is designed for sleep apnea. Lucky me. Um, I have enlarged tonsils and an enlarged uvula. So certainly um, weight can play a role in sleep apnea. There are some people where if they lost some weight, they, it could resolve their sleep apnea. For other people, it can be purely anatomical. So in, in my case, um, it was definitely anatomical in that I fixed the deviated septum, but my the way my jaw is aligned and how crowded the inside of my throat is, I have to sleep with the CPAP machine, which I'll talk about later. So what I find so validating and exciting is when research is done and we can look in the research and see, okay, this is definitely a thing. This is not just my experience. And, and if there's research done about this, then that means that there's going to be some understanding of what we can do about it. Uh, numerous research studies, these are just some. Um, Gruber had looked at uh, children with ADHD 
And these were children that had no other comorbid disorder, so no depression, no anxiety, just straight on ADHD, compared them to children without ADHD, um, done sleep studies, and found that the children with ADHD significantly had decreased REM sleep, which is not only our dream sleep, but also the part, the stage of sleep that is responsible for a feeling of restoration. So if you get decreased REM sleep, you're not waking up feeling as refreshed and restored as you as you can. Uh, higher daytime sleepiness, more problems going to sleep, circadian rhythm abnormalities. So their, um, the amount of time they were in the deep stages of sleep were less than what you would see in non-ADHD counterparts. And overall, they had less sleep. Uh, Shreddle found that the ADHD group reported more sleep complaints, not feeling refreshed in the morning. Lee found ADHD group had shorter sleep duration. Uh, Cortez did a meta-analysis, which a meta-analysis is when you actually examine a, a several studies, numerous studies that look at the same issue and you use these advanced statistical models to kind of pool all of the data together. Um, and in this meta-analysis that included about 722 children with ADHD versus 638 uh, controls, which means children without ADHD, and found that the ADHD group statistically significantly uh, reported more bedtime resistance, problems falling asleep, more problems waking up at night, difficulty with waking up in the morning, sleep disordered breathing, daytime sleepiness, and sleep apnea, um, what they call the apnea hypopnea index. Um, when they actually looked at caregivers, they found uh, Sung actually did a study, which is super important, especially for parents out there, that found that moderate or sleep, severe sleep problems in children with ADHD were strongly associated with the mental health of their primary caregivers, with those caregivers' work attendance and overall family functioning. And that's important because, especially when you have a child with ADHD, their sleep problems become your sleep problems, and you want to help them for their own sake and their health, but it's very important because it affects other people in the family as well. So sleep problems have this ripple effect um, that not only affect the individual who's struggling with them. Uh, Sabansky had compared people with ADHD to controls um, and showed increased nocturnal activity, reduced efficiency in sleep, more awakenings, again, uh, reduced percentage of REM sleep. Um, Gao looked at a group of individuals with ADHD, much higher rate of insomnia, sleep terrors, which sleep terrors are nightmares in a sense. So nightmares, we are bad dreams that we have during REM sleep, um, again, where our body is paralyzed. Night terrors, however, or sleep terrors, are kind of nightmares, but they don't occur during REM sleep. So they can occur in any of the other stages of sleep. And they're often marked by um, a real feeling of terror and a real feeling of fear. And your body's not paralyzed, which is often coupled with sleepwalking and a lot of sort of thrashing um, type of behavior. It could be very scary to see someone in a sleep uh, night terror episode. Um, I had those as well as a child. Um, bruxism and snoring. So that, again, is just a sa small sample just to give you a taste of, one, all of the research that's out there, but a lot of the, the data that data points that we're getting from that. And these are studies also, by the way, that have looked at ADHD children in different parts of the world that have looked at ADHD children in different socioeconomic backgrounds, um, different ethnic backgrounds, and they find that this issue with sleep is pretty universal. So what happens when we don't sleep? Now we know how important sleep is, but particularly with ADHD, it's very important. Um, we know that sleep can, or sleep deprivation rather, can weaken our immune system. It can cause problems with memory, with concentration. It can decrease creative problem solving. Um, all of three of those things are already things that people with ADHD might have issues with in terms of executive functioning. So now it's decreasing those abilities even more. Um, sleep issues accelerate aging, and they can also um, increase academic impairment. 
to our bodies, sleep is not good, not just for our mental health and our cognitive health, but our physical health. When we don't sleep properly, our body um, assumes on an evolutionary basis, it assumes that we're not sleeping because we have a higher order need. And the only other thing we need to do besides sleep to survive is drink water and to eat. And so it assumes that we need food. And so it will, or that we're in a starvation state in some ways, that we're in a famine state. So our bodies, when we're sleep deprived, will lower metabolism, increase our appetite, and this can lead to obesity. And it's a, it can be this both a chicken and the egg. You know, the more sleep deprived people are, the more likely they are to gain weight, the more likely that they, they are to gain weight, the more likely they could have sleep problems. It like and issues like sleep apnea, and it becomes a very vicious cycle. But unlike with ADHD, you would expect, well, if someone has sleep problems, would that reduce their hyperactivity? Nope, just the opposite. It actually increases their hyperactivity, increases their impulsivity, increases their inattentiveness. Um, you'll see much more emotional dysregulation with sleep problems. And there was a study that showed that even one hour of sleep loss, three nights in a row, can significantly impact vigilance and attention on a neuropsychological test called the continuance, continuous performance test, which is a common test that's used to uh, look at the implications or uh, process of ADHD. So that's only one hour of sleep loss, and many of my patients um, are losing a lot more sleep than that. So why is it? Why do these things kind of go hand in hand? Uh, there are multiple theories, and I'll present them sort of in, in not in a nutshell. So one, and what I always find most validating is someone with ADHD is the biology and the, the neurobiology of it. And to know that this is pretty hardwired that we're dealing with. Um, biologically, sleep involves different neurotransmitters in our brain, namely serotonin and GABA. And thus disruptions with these systems can disrupt sleep or influence ADHD. Now we know that GABA, for example, is a neurotransmitter that is responsible for inhibition. So when we have proper amounts of GABA in our brain, we are properly inhibited, meaning that we won't do the thing impulsively. Well, the ADHD brain actually has less available GABA, which means that we, are, we have an uninhibited brain. And that is not a good thing when you're trying to surrender to the end of the day and go to sleep. Many people with ADHD have something called the delayed sleep phase syndrome, which is a circadian rhythm abnormality or disorder. I have DSPS. And what I found so validating when I got that sleep study was they found that I was not entering into stage three, four, which is the deeper levels of sleep until about two in the morning. And they found prior to that, I was basically cycling in stages one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, longer than I should have, um, which made sense because subjectively, I had the sensation that I was awake a lot longer than I actually was. Um, so yeah, my brain is hardwired in that way. Now, that doesn't mean I have to go to bed at 2 a.m. I can still work at that, but at least it helps me know, yes, it is harder for me to go to bed at 11 o'clock than it is for somebody else, but I have to work with that. The ADHD brain also has a delay in melatonin onset. And melatonin basically gets secreted and tells our brain it's time to start getting to sleep. Um, that's why a lot of people with ADHD might be taking melatonin. Um, behaviorally, people with ADHD engage in a lot of behaviors that might lead them to have problems going to sleep, sometimes engaging in high stimulating behavior. But also a lot of people with ADHD, and I could definitely personally relate to this, find that the nighttime can be very focusing for them and free of distractions. No one's going to call me at one in the morning. So certainly in college and graduate school, that was a prime time for writing papers. That was a prime time for doing work because there was nothing else going on in the world. And that was very calming and very soothing. So many folks with ADHD will try to get to bed, but that feeling of productivity is so great of a feeling that they forego sleep, push it aside, and then unfortunately they make up the consequences the next day. Genetically, problems with sleep are genetic. I mean, we know ADHD is highly genetic, 
but also that there are issue uh, genes involved with sleep regulation. There's a gene called catecholamethyltransferase, that's a mouthful, or COMT, which is a gene that basically um, is implicated with dopamine. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter implicated in ADHD, but they find that that um, can be transmitted genetically. So sleep problems actually can be genetic as well as behavioral and biological. We know that many people with ADHD also have anxiety or have depression and other issues like that, which can also impact sleep. And certain, certainly with stimulant medication, although some of my patients take stimulant dose couple hours before they go to sleep, and that actually helps them fall asleep. A number of them cannot do that, and their stimulant medication might keep them up. So in terms of assessment, it's always important, and these are things that I recommend for any of us to do, whether you have ADHD or not, but particularly if you have a problem with ADHD, is keeping somewhat of a sleep diary. Now, it could literally be every time you wake up in the morning talking into your phone and just getting a sense of how many hours a night do you actually sleep. People with ADHD will often vastly overestimate how much they sleep. And then when they actually log it, now not just how many hours are you in bed, because somebody could be in bed for 10 hours, but asleep for four hours. If um, I had a patient recently, he's 16, and I asked him that, and he said, oh, I'm, in, I'm sleeping 10 hours a night. And I said, you're sleeping all of those hours? And he said, oh, I'm, well, I'm in bed all of those hours. And I said, well, how much time are you sleeping? Well, it turns out the first five of those hours, he's on his phone playing Minecraft and different, you know, video games. And then maybe if he's lucky, getting five hours of sleep as a 15 year old is not clearly not enough. What are those hours of sleep? Are you getting, are you sleeping from 10 PM until 6 AM? Or are you sleeping from 2 AM to 8 AM? Are you sleeping from 10 AM to, you know, 3 PM? Um, and that does in fact make a difference. Um, the studies show that the more that we can sleep when the sun is down, the, the higher the quality of sleep, which is why people who work night shifts are highly prone to depression and to anxiety and to those metabolic issues um, because their, their sleep, they're not getting the same amount of sleep, sleeping the same quality, I should say, of sleep when they're sleeping throughout the day. Um, what are your hours on the weekend versus the weekday? Many people might sleep well on the weekdays and then on the weekends, it totally changes. Now, obviously, you know, I'm not saying that everybody has to keep the same schedule seven days a week, but sleep doctors say that we really shouldn't vary more than two hours. So if we're going to bed at 11, waking up at six on the weekdays, and then the weekends, we're going to bed at five in the morning, waking up at one in the afternoon. That's very jarring for the brain, especially the ADHD brain. How do you sleep? Where do you sleep? Do you sleep with the TV on? Do you sleep on the couch? Uh, do you sleep um, with music on? Like I, I'm always interested in that for patients that I work with. What's your usual time going to bed versus falling asleep? Um, many, again, as we know from the research, people with ADHD take a lot longer to fall asleep. And that could be very important as a goal to work on in treatment. Do they wake up in the middle of the night? Do they go to the bathroom? Um, do they have nightmares? Do they take naps throughout the day? If they live with other people, how does their sleep ha how do their sleep habits affect other people in the household? Sometimes asking their spouse or parents or roommates can actually be uh, very rich data because sometimes people aren't aware of those sleep problems. Um, have they ever had a sleep study? And if they did, what were the results? And I always look at certainly the presence of a mood disorder as that can really um, also impact sleep um, in a tremendous way. Now, this is from the National Sleep Foundation that gives you by age about the number of hours that is seen as necessary to sleep and about the range that you will see. So if you look at, for example, young adults from 18 to 25, it's anywhere from about seven to nine hours of sleep they should be getting. When I present this with uh, people that I work with, with ADHD, they're often either laugh um, or they're shocked by how much sleep. Um. Now, again, there's a range. Some people do actually function well off of five and a half to six hours of sleep. Um, so it's not necessary that everybody has to get nine hours of sleep. However, when people say they can function with that, I ask more questions. I ask, are you drinking a lot of caffeine? Are you, um, you know, do you fall asleep very easily? Because I 
would say, if you asked me in high school, do you function off little sleep? I would say, sure. Um, however, I would fall asleep at the drop of a hat in classes that were boring um, to me. Whereas now, especially being treated for the, my sleep apnea, I could still fall asleep if I'm bored enough, but it takes me a lot longer to get to that place. So what do we do with these issues? Um, so first is that studies actually show that the use of stimulants for treating the ADHD can actually help with sleep um, and not directly helping or impacting sleep, but more that it's helping those ADHD symptoms that can lend themselves to sleep problems. Um, as I mentioned earlier, though, people might have to be aware of the administration during the day, what times of day, as it can sometimes impact sleep if they take it too late. And again, I have a number of patients that actually take a dose of stimulants that could keep another patient awake the whole night, actually helps them fall asleep. So it's not a one size fits all deal. Melatonin could be very helpful, and I recommend for people to talk to their primary care physician about that um, because it's, again, it's not a one-size-fits-all, and I want to make sure that you're getting medical advice that is individualized to you, so always check with your doctor. To nap or to not nap, um, I have an older brother who also has ADHD. He is he could do a po those power naps of 20 minutes and feels totally refreshed. If I nap, I will be groggy the rest of the day. Naps do not work well for me. Um, if you are trying to change your sleep time, you don't want to make it too jarring for the brain, but work on trying to get to bed early um, by 20 minute intervals. So if you're going to bed currently at 2 a.m. and your goal is to get to bed by 11, shoot for 1.40 a.m. tonight, 1.20 tomorrow night, 1 a.m. the night after, 12.40 the night after, eventually till you get to 11. Um, otherwise, if you went to bed, you know, at 11 one night, your brain is going to sort of almost go back to that 2 a.m. Uh, time pretty quickly. For kids and for adults who have anatomical issues that might make sleep difficult, um, getting a septoplasty, which is a removal of a deviated septum, which I had in my nose, which actually tremendously helped with daytime breathing and sinus problems that I used to have and things like that. And when I was a kid, I had terrible, terrible ear infections. Um, the, it was a big part of my life until I was 10 years old. And there's no doubt now, and I got that sleep study, that my whole irrigation system of my ear, nose, and throat were totally out of whack um, and likely was the cause of a lot of those ear problems. Tonsillectomies can be helpful, but for adults, I was asked or I was told if I yank my tonsils out, A, it's only 50% effective, and B, it's not permanent all the time. So that picture is a man using a CPAP machine. That's what I use every night to go to sleep. There's nothing pretty about it, um, but I cannot tell you how life-changing it is. And please, if you think you have sleep apnea, get a sleep study, use this machine. It will add years to your life. I mean, basically, um, I was told that my heart... Had I continued untreated for sleep apnea, I could have died of a massive heart attack at the age of 50. And I'm an otherwise healthy person. Um, and because it just puts a number on your heart. And thankfully, I had cardiac tests done and my heart was fine. But um, for a lot of people, this can cause cardiac problems. So it's very, very important. Get a sleep study if you question this. Um, a lot of people with ADHD for the daytime to keep themselves awake, things like fidget toys or externalizing cues that help keep them stimulated, even in environments where they might not feel particularly stimulated. Introducing uh, sensory things that you know help with that. Relaxation exercises or deep breathing can be very helpful, especially for trying to get to sleep, to just calm the body down and have uh, sort of a sense of mindfulness around the body. Things beforehand, some people find taking a warm bath or a shower, um, unplugging from screens, now, I actually work out at the night. Um, there's this gym near my house. It's a 24-hour gym. And it might seem strange to a lot of people, but the nights that I work out at 10 p.m., because I am I work very late on a couple nights of the week, I go to the gym, I come home, I take a shower. I am going to get a better night's sleep that night um, because I've just sort of exhausted and grounded my body. Now, other people, if they worked out at that time, they're going to be up all night. So it's trial and error for all of us. Um, keeping lights dim a couple hours before you go to bed, not having bright lights because that's 
Do you want to basically tell the brain, mm, I guess it's time to be going to bed soon. I keep my bedroom very, very cool. Um, and studies find that if you keep the bed, the bedroom cool, but then have your actual bed nice and cozy, it grounds your body. It almost anchors your body more in the bed to say, ooh, this is a place I want to be. I sleep with a very heavy comforter. Um, there are some people that sleep with weighted blankets, which for me worked in that I got a very deep sleep with a weighted blanket. The problem is I felt groggy the whole rest of the day for whatever reason. So that didn't work for me, but I uh, uh, wholly it didn't work for me, but it definitely worked in giving me a deeper sleep. Um, sound machines can be helpful or light music. I have a picture there of Enya, who is the epitome of very relaxing kind of meditative music. I sometimes have one of her songs on repeat, very low volume, but it's enough that my brain can connect to it and not be thinking about whatever it's going to be thinking about. But it's not stimulating enough because it's the same song on repeat and it eventually kind of is white noise and it can enable me to fall asleep. Darkening shades, keeping the room very dark, and that includes any clocks or lights from phones or anything like that you want to keep to a minimum or eliminate. Don't stay awake too long in bed. If it takes longer than a half hour to fall asleep, it's actually better to get out of bed, but engage either in some non-stimulating kind of activity or, this sounds strange, or just get out of your bed and stand up just by your bed. And especially if your room is cool and you're just standing there bored, you're going to actually get tired. And I've done this many times and I'll be standing and like kind of nodding off, falling asleep, get right back in the bed and go to sleep right away. Um, sleep doctors say we should ban the snooze button from alarm clocks. Um, you really shouldn't be snoozing. And part of that is profit from the sleep by if you're planning on waking up at 7 a.m., get that deep sleep till 7 a.m. Don't set the alarm for 6.30 and then snooze on and off until 7. You're cheating yourself out of that real deep restorative sleep. Um, and it's very jarring for the brain as well when people go in and out of snooze. But also when you snooze, you're more likely to start to tune out the alarm and then actually start sleeping through the alarm. So I often recommend keeping the alarm out of arm's length so you have to get out of bed to shut it off and then immediately just start your day um, rather than snoozing in and out. So I will stop there for questions and answers. Great, great. Thanks so much. There's so, so much there. Um, You've got lots of listeners with various sleep problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> can we talk a little bit about melatonin? Um, mm. Is there a time of day that it's used? How do you test um, what the right dose is? Is it okay for children? So any thoughts you might have on, on using melatonin or sure. other natural remedies for that matter? So the only one I'm really familiar with is melatonin, um, and they usually come in three milligram or five milligram tablets. Um, and they generally, and again, I always urge people to talk to their uh, pediatricians or primary care physicians, but generally have been found to be safe with children um, and adolescents and adults. Um, typically, though, how the, the biggest misconception about melatonin is that it's a sleep aid in the sense that people will take it at the time they're going to bed. And the best time actually to take it is about anywhere from 90 minutes to 120 minutes before you plan on going to sleep, to bed, because you need it to sort of be working and, and kind of setting off this, um, the signals in your brain and your body that are telling you, okay, we're now going to sleep. If you take it at the time of bed, you're really not it's really kind of ineffective. It's People think it's helping them, but it's really not. Um, so it's usually about two hours before, depending sometimes people are pr particularly sensitive to it. It could be an hour before, but it's, it's never at bedtime. Um, they could be very safe there. I have young patients that take it on a daily basis um, and they don't have their, they don't have any side effects. Uh, but again, you know, always check with your doctor. Okay. Um, uh, a problem that's mentioned here that uh, I have a personal interest in is people who wake up, go to sleep easily, and then wake up in the middle of the night. And there's a yeah. mother here whose child sleeps normally fine, but if he wakes up in the middle of the night, that's it. He's awake the rest of the night. Um, yeah. 
any suggestions for that specific kind of sleep disorder, which is very, you know, unsettling, I think. Um, Absolutely. So generally, if we get ample amounts of sleep um, throughout the night, there's actually a period it, typically in the middle of the night where all of us will wake up. It's just mm -hmm. most of us don't remember it. Um, mm -hmm. So what happens is like we're going stage one, two, three, four, REM, four, three, two, one. And sometimes it's during the transition back to an, that whole other cycle of sleep that we we just totally wake up. But again, most people don't know it. They don't remember it. It lasts a couple minutes. They go back to sleep. For the person with ADHD, it's almost like they wake up and they're it's, a, it's like their brain is just searching for kind of some stimulation and they're just now like awake and they become very conscious that they're awake and not asleep. And then it's very hard for them to soothe or calm their bodies down to fall back asleep. So when that happens, you know, part is to is more that, you know, we can't control whether we're going to wake up in the middle of the night is so when that happens, what are things that the person can do? to just a you know don't assume that they're going to be up for the rest of the night because that's often what a lot of people will do they get they're like oh my gosh it's three in the morning i'm never going to get back to sleep the second mm -hmm. we say that our physiology is starting to rev up which is now making it more likely the case that we're going to be up for the rest of the night so even just letting people know this is actually very normal you will be able to fall asleep but we can't we have to prevent that revving up and so if you wake up you just say okay i'm awake and i'm in five minutes i'll most likely be back to sleep um and you know maybe if the person is particularly warm you know putting their arm outside the covers to sort of make themselves a little cooler um maybe they just need to switch positions and maybe then if they have something that's accessible to them um, something that's very comforting, or maybe again, a song on very, very, very low volume. Um, sometimes people, it's easier for them to get out of bed, go to the bathroom, um, and then go right back into bed. Is that that's easier for them to than to just stay in bed, just hoping to fall asleep? Um, but those are usually the kind of um, activities, but it's actually not um, the, the waking up isn't particularly the abnormal part. It's more that the person with ADHD is waking up and then it's almost like they, they're elevated um, in terms of the, and the awareness that they're awake and then their mind can start you know, racing and finding it difficult to fall asleep. Right. Also, just as another thing too, and this is something to talk with the doctor about, is that sometimes it might be useful to push bedtime a little bit later sometimes to see if that makes a difference. I had a patient who this very similar issue, he would go to bed at nine o'clock and clockwork wake up at 2.30 in the morning, just mm -hmm. like wide awake um, and would get really fearful and ex anxious that he wouldn't go back to sleep. And we tried different things. And then when we pushed the bedtime to 940, I think it was, for whatever reason, he didn't have that awakening anymore. So I don't know if it just shifts something in the cycle um, mm -hmm. or sometimes maybe even going to bed earlier, but sometimes you have to play around with that to see if it makes a difference. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I, um, I have a severe middle of the night problem and I've been trying going to bed earlier, which seems to be helping. But to your point, I guess, try different times which maybe affects your body's REM cycle or whatever yeah um speaking of REM sleep and other sleeps there are a number of people who use Fitbits and other apps to, and they're wondering do you think they're they're accurate right in terms of measuring REM sleep versus you know light sleep versus deep deep sleep and if they are accurate what does one do with the information you know, <laughs> which you get every day about your sleep cycle about the sleep. So yes, there are some apps that will sort of tell you, um, and you know, I usually tell people, I mean, A, they will bring it in to me or bring it in, you know, to their uh, primary care doctors and see, you know, what are, what are things that can help them with that? So for example, if the app gives you data that you're moving a lot um, in your sleep, that, you know, we start with, okay, is your bed comfortable? Is it actually pretty comfortable? Do you need a wedge pillow? I sleep with a wedge pillow. I When I sleep kind of horizontally, my the sensation is that I'm sleeping 
almost like with my head further back, like at an angle. It feels very odd to me. Um, so I have to sleep with a wedge pillow. So I'm angled upwards in a way, and that helps me just sleep better. It's just more comfortable. Um, so if that can be helpful, is it restless leg syndrome? Is it, you know, sleep apnea? Um, you know, what what's going on with that? So it's that data could be useful if people then can correlate it with certain and tie it to certain strategies um, that they might get that they can present their their doctor with. In fact, a lot of uh, sleep studies now are moving towards home sleep studies with using technology and, and some of these apps. Frankly, I would push, if you can, for the sleep lab sleep study. That's what I had. Um, and it's just there's just much more data that you get from that um, than doing it at home. Um, but, you know, again, it can still give you data at home, but it might not be as comprehensive as what you get in the lab. Mm -hmm. I've heard that the, the home sleep studies just aren't as accurate. And, Th they're um, not as accurate. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, hmm, question from Carrie. What about reading in bed? Hmm. Mm -hmm. So reading in bed, it again, is not a one size fits all. So I mm -hmm. can tell you my dilemma with it is I, for me to read something in general, I have to really, really be interested in it. Um, so reading is just one of those things. I'm not a fast reader. And so if I'm and I don't really read fiction. So if I'm reading psych psychology related stuff, which is fascinating to me, it'll be very difficult for me to fall asleep. Um, now, however, many of my patients with ADHD, that's exactly what they do. They read and it can kind of, it just helps calm them. It helps them not be thinking about other things that could be keeping them up. And they put the book aside, they shut the light and they go to bed. Um, so that can be very helpful. So it's one of those things that you have to test out for yourself or for your children. Um, and that could be, you know, very helpful or it really can't. I have some patients that says I, I can't read in bed because either I'm not interested in what I'm reading and now I'm like bored and want to do something that's more stimulating or I'm super interested in the book and I was up all night reading it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, oh boy, here there are at least 10 questions here. What are your best tips for going back to sleep when you wake up at 3 a.m.? What, how do, how can I get my child to go back to sleep in the middle of the night? He, he needs to wake me up every time this happens, and we're all exhausted. So, yeah, that, that question keeps coming up. Um, yeah. It's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, I mean, first of all, you know, depending on the age of the child, you know, at, at some point you want them – to um, learn to sort of soothe themselves to get to sleep. Um, so, you know, if they're scared or whatnot, they might wake you up, but you don't want to make that a habit, um, especially as they get older, because what that teaches them is that they don't have any internal resources to get themselves and soothe themselves back, you know, to sleep, um, that they're looking for you to do that. Um, you know, so it's something you have, it's tricky. And, and if there's anxiety around it, you know, obviously you want to be soothing and supportive, but, you know, have the child at least have, you know, I might have them write like together, you can work with them in writing maybe four or five things that they can do if they wake up in the middle of the night. So it's like, these are your tools in your toolbox. So if you have a hard time, you know, maybe, if reading helps that child, or if they have a stuffed animal that's very uh, soothing from a tactile level for them, um, you know, that they can do. Um, if they have to just get up and go to the bathroom and go back, you know, into bed, um, finding things like that. And then maybe say, if, the, if these don't work and you're having a hard time, you know, then wake me up. Like, so part of it is also having them recognize, which is not just about sleep, but about their ADHD in general, is that you're really teaching your child that they have to start to sort of work on these skills and develop these kind of strategies for themselves. Now, obviously, with your support and your help, but they you don't want to be seen as the tool um, that's helping them fall asleep. Um, so for example, you know, with my son who has ADHD, that it was you know, he's, he's his father's son, that it was very difficult for him to fall asleep. And I sung a lot, like I, we were a big music family. So I would sing mm -hmm. a lot. And then eventually as he, you know, got older, 
you know, I would, I would actually sing, um, into, you know, a phone or something like that. And he would press that and hear me like singing to him. And then that would get him to sleep. So I didn't have, you know, he didn't have to wake me up necessarily. Now, of course, if your child is scared and whatnot, then that's a different, you know, story. But if it's more of an issue of them not being able to soothe or ground themselves, you want to work together with them to help them start to do those things for themselves. Okay. That makes sense. Um, um, a lot of concern about whether melatonin is safe. So here's an example from Tia. My 13 year old son insists that he needs one milligram of melatonin to go to sleep, even on non-school evenings. I want to convince him to only use it if necessary. Is there research that this is harmful or addictive? And there are similar questions, you know, we've tried melatonin, is this safe long-term? So there's a concern in general about some sort of an addiction to melatonin or some sort of damage over the long haul from using melatonin, even among people it would seem for whom it's successful. Yeah, I'm not familiar with an, any addiction um, to it. I think that part of it may be for some individuals, you know, if you're someone who has a hard time falling asleep and sleep is very fitful and it's very difficult, um, anything that works that helps you fall asleep can feel really good and really reinforcing. Um, now, sometimes melatonin can have a placebo effect. Again, mm -hmm. you know, if somebody's taking it right before bed, it's that's probably not the melatonin that's getting them to sleep um, because right. it's not that two hour window. But if they think they're going to be falling asleep, they might be more calm, which is the then making them better able to fall asleep. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that it's not addictive. I'm not familiar with research that points to that. Um, and I've worked with people with kids and teenagers who take it regularly and their doctors and pediatricians say it's it's safe. Um, but again, you know, I would talk, talk to your doctors and certainly it also depends on the dose. I mean, like five milligrams is a, is considered a pretty high dose for a young person. Um, so a lot of the, you know, people will typically take a three milligram or like a one milligram and be fine, you know, with that. Um, so I, I would suspect that the higher the dose, perhaps you might see some, you know, side effects, but um, the studies I'm familiar with haven't shown any sort of danger necessarily um, with it. But I, again, I wouldn't say everyone should take it and it's safe for everybody because it sure. could vary okay. by individual. Um, interesting. Here's an interesting question. Dr. Olivardia, I noticed that if I cut caffeine out completely, my sleep is improves. However, without mm -hmm. the caffeine, I just can't launch into a productive day. Um, I've tried quitting caffeine, but it doesn't work. What do I do? <laughs> yeah. Caffeine is a, is a really interesting um, point. So caffeine is a stimulant obviously. And so for, um, a lot of people with ADHD, in general, they should, you know, monitor their caffeine intake because a lot of times they could be self-medicating um, with caffeine. And um, that could absolutely play a role in keeping people up later at night. And at the same time, just like with the stimulants that I mentioned, where some people can't take a dose after a certain time or it affects their sleep, where others could take it two hours beforehand. Um, I have patients who will drink a cup of coffee an hour before they go to sleep, and they're better able to go to sleep because they say they're more able to focus on just falling asleep. Um, so in a sense, they're getting like a low dose stimulant. Now that's not the same as drinking an energy drink or a latte or an espresso before going to bed. Um, so, you know, I always think a part of having ADHD in my own experience is, you know, you're kind of your own investigator and kind of, you know, even as a kid, I used to almost think of it as like this fun, creative activity of figuring myself out and what's going to work and what's not going to work. So I would keep a, a log, like if you don't have caffeine, you know, you might find that if it isn't helping in terms of your productivity in the day, but maybe if you had a cup of coffee at a certain time, maybe that helps with the productivity enough and it doesn't impact, it does not impact your sleep in a negative way, that might be the sweet spot. Or you might find that instead you have to cut, cut out caffeine and maybe taking a stimulant, a low stimulant dosage might you know be helpful. Um, I have some patients that cannot have caffeine past 3 p.m. or they will feel it that night and it will affect them that night. I have other patients say the caffeine actually keeps them focused and, you know, productive and they're fully 
um, exhausted by the end of the day because they were productive and they've done what they were supposed to do in the day, which means they didn't procrastinate, which means they don't need to be up till one in the morning. And so it helps them in the long run. So keep, you know, I would sort of keep your own data around it. Um, it isn't, again, a one size fits all. In general, though, I would say, you know, drinking 20 cups of coffee is never going to be a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. I work with teenagers that drink energy drinks, two or three of those a day, which is tremendous amounts of caffeine as well as other chemicals that are in that um, that are really not good um, for you, where you can literally develop an addiction to caffeine. Um, and there is something called like a caffeine intoxication syndrome. Um, so you definitely, I'm glad that that question got brought up because caffeine is one of those things that's not altogether bad and coffee isn't altogether bad. It's more about how you use it and to what extent. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I think your point um, of the personal, the individual response to all of this and the keeping a sleep diary so you know what's happening makes a huge amount of sense. Um, um, I got a good question. Who do I see in order to get a referral for a sleep study? What kind of a doctor should I see? How do I do that? Yeah, so usually it starts with your primary care physician. So I first went um, to my primary care physician. He's a wonderful, wonderful doctor. And I said, you know what? I have been snoring since I was nine years old. I mean, my brother, who I shared a room with, used to refer to me as a human chainsaw um, and didn't understand how, as for a short, skinny kid, the sound came out of me. Um, and <laughs> But at the, at the time, it was like, okay, you're a bad snorer. Like there was... And I said, I'm snoring and I have a patient with ADHD and sleep apnea. And I started reading about sleep apnea and I actually have almost all of these symptoms. So he referred me to um, a sleep lab um, in the area and that's how I got my sleep study. So you, usually your primary care, they'll often ask you about it. There's um, questionnaires that they might give you about, you know, do you have trouble? And I, I checked all of them. I endorsed. I mean, I had trouble staying awake in the day. Um, you know, it, it never felt refreshed ever, ever, ever felt refreshed waking up in the morning until I started using the CPAP. Um, snoring. Do you, if you're living with someone, do they complain about your snoring? Yes. Um, you know, that all of these things that then if you hit often like a clinical threshold would make a referral to a sleep study. And if it's okay. a child, to talk to your child's pediatrician about it. Got it. Okay. Um, questions about a number of other treatments. So some of them that are asked, being asked about are CBD, um, GABA, mm -hmm. um, uh, marijuana. Um, mm. How do any of these affect sleep? Um, treat sleep? Um, are there risks inherent in, in, in using any of these as for sleep aid? Yes. So the jury is out um, with that. So I don't, well, with CBD, it's so new and some people swear by it. Um, I'm not convinced. Um, I, I, you know, the, the, for me, the research isn't solid um, on it. Um, I don't know, you know, as well. I mean, sleep is one of those things like weight loss where, you know, people try anything um, for mm -hmm. because it's so important, you know, to get sleep. Um, so I haven't seen any, I wouldn't say that I certainly have seen in any patients who have, and not many of my patients have tried CBD, but the ones that have, I, I, I wouldn't attribute um, any positive effects, you know, necessarily to that. And we don't know how much harm could be caused by that because these are new things. Um, same with GABA. I'm not too, I mean, I, we know that GABA, again, is this inhibitory neurotransmitter, you know, could make sense clinically why it would work, but um, the, I'm not, the data is not compelling enough yet. So I certainly wouldn't make that recommendation. Um, with marijuana, I would strongly recommend against it, um, that we could do a whole webinar just on marijuana mm -hmm. and cannabis. People with ADHD are at very high risk um, for dependence on cannabis. I treat many patients with ADHD who are addicted to cannabis. You can be addicted to marijuana, despite what people think, um, especially the marijuana today has higher THC levels. Um, there's a whole whole problem associated with that. Um, marijuana elevates levels of dopamine in the brain, which can be very reinforcing to an ADD brain. 
So I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend that um, because the people that I've worked with who are dependent on marijuana, a lot of them started with taking marijuana just to get to sleep, to help them get wow. to sleep. Okay. And that's how it started. And then it be, I mean, it really spirals into a bad thing. So I, I would not recommend that at all. OK, Um we should do that webinar on marijuana and ADHD. Yes. Yeah, because it does come up a lot as self-medication. Um, uh, oh, boy, this is another question similar to the one we've asked is, what do you recommend for a child who just can't, quote, stop their thoughts when they try to go to bed? Yeah. They try reading, drawing, relaxing. When the lights yes. go off, he just keeps thinking and thinking and can't go to sleep. Yes. So I can totally relate. So what I did as a kid is um, I would have a notebook um, and maybe an hour before planning on going to sleep, I would, you know, just basically purge out anything that was in my head in that notebook um, and whatever. And, and again, it wasn't sometimes it was things I was anxious about. Sometimes it mm -hmm. was things I was excited about. Sometimes it was just reviewing the day. I mean, part of it also that's so important is part of why sleep and, and the, that nighttime is so difficult is it could be the first time of the day that the person with ADHD is actually just sitting mindfully with their thoughts. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, I mean, there's lying in bed, there's no stimulation. So part of what you want to try to do is if you can create a part of the day and not like right before bedtime, I recommend like a couple hours before bedtime, where it is their kind of Zen zone, you know, where mm -hmm. there's no screens, where they can sit down and maybe, you know, when they're young, especially they can converse with you. Like, how was your day? Let's mentally review your day. Um, what's on your mind right now? You know, let's think like, in a sense, like let's purge this out now. Um, because once you go to bed, especially if that ADHD kid or adult is going, 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 and then, and this would, would happen to me. And then I lie in bed. I'm like, Bing, now all my internal, like all my thoughts are like on and I'm reviewing and I'm thinking of stuff and I'm making connections. And, but a lot of, some of that was, I wasn't giving myself that time during the day. So having this notebook where they sort of write out their thoughts or talk out, you know, their thoughts. And then if it's something that they're anxious about, you know, doing things like deep breathing, there's something called progressive muscle relaxation. Um, if you put it on YouTube, there are some uh, guided progressive muscle relaxation techniques, which basically involves tensing specific muscle groups for seven to 10 seconds and then relaxing them. That really helps the body relax. And sometimes in bed, you can do this. And the whole thing from head to toe is about 20 minutes. And I never get to the end of it before falling asleep. Oh, so yeah. doing that with your, your child um, or as an adult, you know, deep breathing, again, PMR, progressive muscle relaxation, um, sometimes like doing kind of activities like um, – uh, those coloring books of um i forget the, the mandalas is that the name of it mm -hmm. like the sort of buddhist um you know where it's like there's this almost meditative aspect to it of of coloring like those things can be very helpful if they wake up in the middle of the night they have a couple colored pencils and they're just kind of coloring in and that's not highly stimulating it's not like they're coloring like or drawing their own picture they're just coloring in the lines and it has a very sort of relaxing element to it um, there's sometimes like aquariums can be very soothing and relaxing. Now, not everyone has an aquarium, but there are YouTube channels where you can type aquarium and it's literally just an aquarium mm -hmm. and the sound of just an aquarium, um, that you could do. I mean, that's the wonderful, that's the good use of something like YouTube and these videos, sometimes they run like five hours so you can have it on and then, you know, feel relaxed and then go back, you know, to sleep. So it's finding something that's not going to overstimulate them, but stimulate them enough so that they're not distracted by all of the other thoughts they have. But we all ha we all need a brain dump at the end of the day, in a sense of just dumping out all those thoughts that we have. And again, I would recommend doing that not right before you go into bed, because then it's just going to carry with you about a couple hours before saying, let's, let's get out, you know, all of that, and realize that these things that even let's say, if it's something you're worried about, these things can wait until tomorrow, like you're not going to solve the world's problems is lying in your bed at night, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, so as long as you know what you want to 
think about tomorrow, then let's write it down. So when you wake up, you'd be like, okay, things I want to think about. And then, you know, those are the things. And then it sort of compartmentalizes that for the, for the individual. I think that's an inspired idea. And, and to help your child by helping them learn those techniques so that they're empowered themselves to put themselves yes. back to sleep seems really like a great idea. There's just been some terrific ideas here, Dr. Olivardia. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, sure. we are out of time. I wanted to tell everyone about our upcoming webinars. Um, Monday, September 30 is the first of our ADHD Awareness Month webinars, and it is with Dr. Dodson. It's basically uh, basics. What is ADHD? What do you need to know? If you're wondering whether you have it and maybe you just were diagnosed, so it'll be a very basic webinar that you might send friends, family, um, people who just aren't familiar with ADHD to it. And then on Wednesday, October 2nd, a technology one, struggling to AD and HD apps, tech, um, what helps in the classroom. So those are next two. And for those of you I, who I mentioned who would like a certificate of attendance, please stay and wait for the quiz to pop up and take the questions and you should receive your certificate in the mail. So thanks everybody for being here today. And thank you so much, Dr. Olivardio, as always a really fascinating um, presentation. Thanks, everybody. Oh, my pleasure.